So I warn you, this is going to be the optimistic panel. So if you want to walk away, you have the opportunity now. At least this is what I have asked from the speakers. I don't know whether we will manage that from Greece, but uh, we'll try hard. So we want to um, see where do we go from here. I mean, we uh, know causes, symptoms. Maybe we should try in this panel to discuss about the future and about possible solutions, which of course is not an easy task. Let me introduce first myself. My name is Jos Maria Benito. I am a professor of European uh, law, international law, international relations in Madrid. I was a Pierre Keller visiting professor at the Kennedy School last year. Uh, in my previous life, I was also an international lawyer and a member of the Spanish Parliament and vice chair of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I have published extensively on the EU. My last two co-authored books are on the EU and China and the external relations of the EU. And most importantly, I was a fellow at the Center for European Studies uh, quite a number of years ago. Um, pre prehistoric times, uh, 88 to 90, where we were still at uh, 5 Bryan Street. So it's a great pleasure to be back here at CES. And thank you very much for the invitation to uh, Jagots and to um, my good friend Elaine Papoulis. So, to be chair of a panel is uh, probably the um, perfect job, the dream job. You don't need to do anything really. So, uh, you just need to introduce the speakers and then ask some questions afterwards. At least that this is what I'm going to do. But before that, let me just um, make some very brief remarks on which are the factors of integration that we have in Europe right now? Um, and there are some of them. First of all, the institutions. They are working. And they provide a framework which has been solving, certainly not in a perfect way, but throughout the different crises, the institutions have been providing common solutions, negotiated solutions, together with the government to the different crises. So we need a strong institutions in the EU. And we are going to face next year a very important battle. It's going to be a very uh, significant political fight. Populism expect to attain up to 30, 35% of the vote. Um, and of course, there is a need here for mobilization of civil society in order to be able to um, react uh, to the challenges that uh, the populist parties from left and right are uh, bringing um, into the political landscape in Europe. So the institutions are a first integrating, reintegrating um, factor of the disintegrative elements that we now um, see in Europe. And then Germany. We had this discussion now during lunch, but I think that Germany has been a stability factor. And when you listen to the political classes, we had this uh, opportunity to listen to Sigma Gabriel uh, from Germany. You see that there is a very basic common understanding, and even the new candidates particularly Friedrich Merz uh, on the Christian Democratic side, is showing, again, this uh, very strong commitment to Europe. Uh, Germany is the only country which has put as um, a destiny for its constitutional development the unification of Europe. Uh, it's the only country which really has brought together mm, the own national um, development with the uh, development of the European Union. So Germany is going to be a very important factor into the years to come. And of course, Germany with uh, France and with what Macron has offered. And this is as always very difficult because if you move too fast, then you get backlashes. And this is what has happened with the so-called Hanseatic League, this group of northern European countries, which are very much critical against some of the more ambitious proposals of Macron 
for the Eurozone and the different institutional developments that he has proposed uh, on that side. A third, I think, integrative uh, moment which can have a certain uh, efficacy uh, in the years to come is the backlash coming from civil society. And I would just refer to one example, which is Brexit. As you know, only 30% of the younger people voted in the first referendum in Brexit, and most of those votes were in favor of European, of staying, uh, of remaining. Um, now, it is uh, accounted that 70 to 80% of the younger voters would be willing to vote in an eventual second referendum. So there is this capacity of civil society and this capacity of different sectors of the European population to react and to mobilize in a pro-European um, direction. So I would also be more optimistic on that side that, so that sometimes um, academic or any other talks, um, um, you know, um, um, bring to the fore. And then fourth integrative factor, which could be, and I think here Europe has taken the wrong enemy. I don't, I don't think that Russia uh, should be uh, the enemy to fight, and nor China is an enemy. But it is very clear that we need a common policy towards China. Uh, so I would be in favor of having a common investment policy uh, to a China, something which is being discussed in the European Parliament, of course, very complicated to attain, uh, but against the individualistic uh, decisions and movements in this respect of different European countries, I think that there we could also have an integrative moment for the future. So I don't want to be any longer. I am just going to give the floor to the three speakers. Great. Uh, to have here with us uh, three speakers who are going to face, first of all, Vivian Schmidt, um, the more current, the more global uh, perspective on future of European Union, um, why the crisis, how they have been solved, and particularly, where do we go from here? What can we, um, what could be possible for the development of the European Union in next years. As you know, Vivian is Giammone Professor of European Integration and Professor of International Relations of Political Science at Boston University. And she's also the co-chair of the European Union Seminar here at CES. Then um, we'll turn to John Dalhuysen, who is an expert in migration policy. He has been director of Amnesty International's Europe and Central Asia program and region, regional office from 2012 to 2017. He's currently a senior fellow at the European Stability uh, Initiative. And before that, uh, he was special advisor to the First Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. <coughs> He's going to talk specifically about migration and answers to the migration uh, problem. And then Kiriakos Pierrakakis, um, who is Director of Research of the Aneosis, a think tank based in Athens, and also one of our sponsors, thank you very much, uh, which focuses on the economic and social reconstruction of the country. He served as member of the Greek government's negotiating team with the Troika of Lenders in 2014. Uh, so he's going to uh, focus on Greece. With further ado, I give you the floor to Vivian. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Um, and so my remarks will be looking at current problems, possible futures. I will try to be positive. Um, but I'm going to ask questions, where do we go from here, and how do we get there? And I'll start with the crisis challenges in terms of policy and politics. Uh, then go on to what to do, what can be done in policy and politics, very briefly, obviously. And then how do we go forward? And in a way, I'm going to ask, how do we imagine a future Europe that can deal with these many different ways in which different 
parts of the EU are going in terms of the various policy areas and also given the politics. Um, so first, of course, and we've been hear hearing about this this morning all day, actually, um, the big question is integration or, or disintegration, and it's all about the EU's cascading series of crises. The Eurozone crisis, you know, we face the possible potential collapse of European economies if the Euro were to explode, but countries too big to bail, banks too big to fail. We still see the crisis is going on today. It's not been resolved. The Italy budget, Italy's budget issues already, but Greece will hear more still an issue. Um, as already we heard this morning, there's the security crisis, terrorism, Russia, Europe's neighborhood, Middle East, North Africa. Yeah, we're not going to go there. Um, but then we've got the refugee and the mi migration crisis. Fortunately, we hear more about that from John. But, you know, tremendous member state divisions on what to do. Um, and what if a crisis like that of 2015 were to happen again in terms of refugees migrants spilling out of Turkey, up from Libya, et cetera. Um, in addition, what was interesting is until you mentioned Brexit, I think we only had one other mention of it very briefly. Uh, but Brexit, of course, is a very big issue still today. Um, there are the dangers of disintegration, but I would say much less for the EU than for the UK itself. Uh, Trump, we heard this morning, uncertainties for trade, issues of security, we do remember Trump saying that NATO, that U.S. Would, would withdraw from NATO. No need to go on more. That was tremendously enlightening this morning. Um, also heard of issues of populism and illiberal non-democracies. Um, but there's, in addition to this, we would have to add, the EU itself has a crisis of legitimacy concerning both its own governing authority and its governing activities. So the question becomes, what are the possibilities for resolving these crises? And in so doing, do we get more or less EU integration what are the threats of possible disintegration? So the first crisis I'll begin with, and the one that I've been obsessed with for the past many years, is the Eurozone crisis. And there, what one can say is there's been deep integration, uh, for better or for worse, depending upon what uh, point of view you have. But basically, even though there's been a lot of deeper integration, it's not enough. We've seen the basics, the setting up of banking union, the SSM, the single supervisory mechanism, the SRF, the single resolution front fund, the ESM, the European stability mechanism. Whew, managed to get those right. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, there's still much to be done. There's no individual deposit insurance. There's no real backstop, financial backstop, for the single resolution fund. Um, the French have been talking about, and others have been talking about, having an e a finance minister, the EU's own budget for investment. These are all very important. There's also been lots of talk about an unemployment adjustment fund that the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, were to become a European, true European monetary fund. And of course, there's always that issue that keeps coming back, euro bonds that's now called safe assets. It's going nowhere. Uh, it's never happening why Germany and Northern Europe are opposed. So what are the dangers with all of this? Were there dangers for EU disintegration? I don't see that happening, but there are these dangers. We're still caught in suboptimal stability rules for low deficits, low debt, that have been leading to low investment and anemic growth. Uh, there are still tremendous problems between North and Southern Europe uh, in terms of unwillingness on the risk-sharing issues, and in basically a lack of trust. And Hanseatic League is just more of that. Um, the possibilities for deeper integration, OK. So the question would be more Europe or less Europe. More Europe would actually see real fiscal fe federalism, real risk-sharing, which would mean some kinds of shared uh, safe assets, um, at least an unemployment adjustment fund, but, but certainly to start with individual deposit insurance. All of these are tremendously necessary. Um, and if they're not there, where do we go? Because they're not actually going to be there for a while. Um, 
We need to think about less integration, perhaps, in the Eurozone. And that might mean something as simple as allowing member states to invest in growth-enhancing areas without counting that toward their deficits. That's a very simple little thing. You can already do it with the Juncker Fund. But ev even that would at least help kickstart growth in southern Europe. Uh, and those countries that, what is it, don't have the fiscal space, I think is the technical word. Um, but also, one would need to talk about increasing flexibility in the rules, as opposed to what the Hanseatic League has been talking about, is increasing um, that. But of course, that's only the Eurozone crisis, and that's been quiet off the pages, uh, off the pages of the newspapers, except with Italy. But the security crisis, we've already heard this morning, there's actually too little integration, but there's a pathway forward. There is already discussion of PESCO, merging CSDP and NATO, uh, building, new capa build, building capacity in new institutions, perhaps. But maybe there's too much differentiation in the institutions or the instruments that are already there. On the migration crisis, there's too little integration and no pathway forward although maybe John can tell us more, but it's an intractable problem, and among other things, forced quotas don't work. To be perfectly honest, I would not be the refugee, I would not want to be the refugee who's sent to Hungary or Poland. Forced quotas, exactly, so even better. <laughs> right, but so there needs to be another way to approach this, and perhaps you need incentives via EU support funds of some kind for the countries that do accept refugees and more migrants, maybe circular visas so that, so that migrants who come, say, from Northern Europe can come to Europe and then go back. I mean, there, but there are experts who have better ideas about this. Brexit, I guess we can talk about too much integration um, for the British uh, and only for some. Uh, but anyway, you know, is there going to be a no deal, bad deal, good debt, good deal? Are they going to stay? I'm so sick of it all. <laughs> I mean, every day you read another discussion that gets nowhere. But, um, but, <laughs> but if it doesn't succeed, if, if there is no deal or an accident, um, the UK will be all alone in the North Sea, perhaps? And I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves is the UK leaving better for EU integration? If the UK leaves, is it better for integration or worse? Those are the questions that I'm going to leave hanging. Um, but what about the EU's crisis of legitimacy and politics? I mean, legitimacy is really in question in all of these areas in part because uh, they remain unresolved. So one, there's a loss of citizen trust and consent in terms of the EU. So this is about the EU's legitimacy in terms of the EU's governing authority. And then, of course, there are all the problems with the EU's governing activity. Uh, issues of policy effectiveness and performance, in particular in the Eurozone and the migration crisis. Uh, concerns about a lack of political responsiveness on the part of mainstream parties taking instead an issue with being responsible to the EU treaties, but as a result, not doing what their publics might want. And certainly, it's very different in different countries, but highly problematic in all cases. And there are all the procedural questions of accountability and transparency. And who knows what goes on in the council meeting? So if, as Sigmar Gabriel said, we are going to have a more intergovernmental Europe, there may be even more problems in terms of legitimacy, unless there be there become some ways of being more transparent and accountable. Um, and all of these problems with legitimacy, governing activity and authority, uh, helps us understand perhaps some of the populist revolt. Zegorsh uh, and others on the panel earlier did a wonderful job descri describing all of the problems, the economics of the people feeling left behind, the socio-cultural concerns about migration and the changing faces of the nation. Uh, but there's also, and the political desire to take back control. And this is about not just globalization, but Europeanization, governance, supranational governance, and its impact on national democracies, 
And the problem is you vote at the national level, and decisions are increasingly taken at the EU level. And so the populist revolt, we see populist parties, it's the same kinds of messages, it's anti-elite, anti-corruption, us versus them, um, leaders speaking for the people as well as to, to the people with post-truth, lies, fake news, uh, including, and this wasn't mentioned much this morning, but the sort of the social media, the activist networks of echo chambers on Facebook, but also then the mass media and the way in which it becomes an amplifier every time uh, President Trump tweets. Um, I think all of these, we need to see that this is a different moment in time and ask, us, ask ourselves, why now, why in this way? Well, as Jegor said this morning, it's not just the demand side, people are unhappy, but it's also the supply side. There are new leaders willing to break the kinds of taboos that people didn't do in the past. And all of this has led to politicization in Europe in three different ways. There's politicization at the bottom, which is populism, as we've seen it. There's politicization from the bottom up, how it affects the council and member states responding. That's not just populism, that's Angela Merkel saying she can't do what she might want to do because of how, um, how the, her electorate might respond. And this includes delaying any kind, of ref and any kind of positive response on the Eurozone crisis until it was almost too late for Greece. But there's also a politicization at the top. And if you look at the interactions amongst EU institutional actors, it's become highly politicized. It's now about who's in charge, who's in control, what you can do, and this is between the Council and the Commission, the Council and the ECB. It's also about the European Parliament. Um, and you could say, in some ways, this is a good thing because there's more political debate, public debate at the EU level, which is actually legitimizing. But you could also say, in another way, it's actually a bad thing because it's delegitimizing if you actually look at the content of the discourse, which is always, no, you can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. No, that's bad. Um, so highly problematic. So what does this then mean for the future of European integration? How do we think about the future of integration when we see very different kinds of possible solutions or non-solutions uh, to all of these various crises? And on top of that, all of this politicization, and of course what it means in the council, as we heard again earlier today, how do you get a consensus? How do you get agreement to move forward in any way? So for me, the answer is differentiated Europe, differentiated integration. And the truth is, even though there's all of this talk about how we have to go together forward, et cetera, um, we've gotten rid of the ever closer union, but um, motto, but um, the, I think it's important to recognize that the European Union is already highly differentiated. There's been variable geometry in all sorts of areas other than the single market for a very long time, and even the single market allows for opt-outs via informal governance for countries that have a real problem with this or that. So think about Schengen borders. The UK has never been in, not Ireland, but Norway, Iceland, and Switzerland are. Uh, security and defense, Denmark's not in, but Norway is. All members can opt in or out. And now we've got PESCO, Framework Nas Nation Concept, European Intervention Initiative, lots of all sorts of possibilities. Um, but in terms of differentiated integration, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, opt-outs for the UK and Poland, the Euro, I mean, it's the most interesting case, in particular, given that people keep talking about we can have a hardcore Europe around the euro going forward. There are 19 of the 27 in. There are outsiders with permanent opt-outs, the UK, who will opt out permanently for more than that, perhaps. Um, but the UK and Denmark, resistant, but no opt-out is Sweden, not yet ready to opt in. The other Central and Eastern European countries that aren't there, but everyone is part of the, of the Stability and Growth Pact. Everyone is part of the six pack. Um, all but the UK and the Czech Republic are part of the fiscal compact. This is a very weird kind of highly still differentiated even for the Euro, which is seen as one of the areas of key uh, integration. And then of course, there's enhanced cooperation in divorce, patents, uh, the financial transaction tax, it's not there yet, but 
Um, so with all such variability um, and with different really membership in different policy areas, um, where is Europe going to go? How do, you, how do you understand that? How do we imagine the future of differentiation? And for me, uh, there's no possibility of a future two-speed Europe or even a Eurozone uh, or a future Europe with a Eurozone as the hard core and its own Euro Parliament. What I see is the finalité of what I would call a soft core Europe as opposed to hard core. Because what we've already got is overlapping sort of clusters of member states in the EU's different policy communities. And uh, most member states are actually in most of these policy communities, and everyone's in the single market. So everyone's part of it, but then some will be part of defense and others part of the euro, a large number is part of the euro, um, et cetera. But I think in all of this, one has to think a single set of institutions to administer and oversee all of these policy communities in order to make it hold together, not simply by the single market, um, but equally by the institutions. And in this, all members should be able to exercise voice, but they should be able to vote in only in the areas in which they participate, which are actually lots of areas, given that they're all part of the single market. But beyond that, you need better governance. We've already heard about the problems of the unanimity rule. There needs to be some kind of a move to super majorities with opt-outs. Mario Monti is the one who actually introduced this topic already many years ago. Um, uh, and I think Daniele even talked about QMV on PESCO and defense. Um, but beyond that, Dieter Grimm talks about, I think, a very good idea is to take the treaty-based laws and turn them into ordinary legislation. Meaning that instead of having to reverse them via uh, unanimity rule, you can have co-decision, essentially. And thus, even if you don't get these changed, you can have public debate about them using the European Parliament as well as considered in the Council. And so I guess ultimately we also need more democracy. That means involving national governments in in the discussions, possibly with the European Parliament. I think to now there's one day they get to meet together, uh, various national, and, but more you need more of that and find new ways for more citizen participation from the ground up. So to conclude, differentiated integration 2.0, or perhaps we should call it 3.0, um, it's a soft core Europe of multiple clusters of member states and overlapping policy communities. It's not a hard core Europe. So it's not a Europe with a one set menu. So we're, we're now, after our lunch, I have to bring in a menu uh, analogy here. Um, but it's not one set menu, not prefix, pas de substitution. Uh, it's not Europe à la carte either, where everyone orders different courses. It's rather an elaborate gourmet menu Europe. For the members, there's one main dish. That's the single market. Everyone sits around the table, however. They all engage in the conversation. They vote on the dishes they consume. And they sit, but they can sit out one or another. And if they can look at their neighbor's dish, they can discuss it. But of course, they can't eat it. Um, guests can join the diners <laughs> at the table. They can partake of one or more dishes as they learn the manners of the table, the rules of conversation. Where do we put the UK? Sit, does it sit, exactly, <laughs> sit at a side table. It's allowed to listen to the conversations, but it can't join in unless it's invited. Or actually, is it just a guest joining in for only a few courses and always suffering indigestion? <laughs> I stop there. Thank you, Vivian, for this gastronomic program. Very interesting. Um, we are now going to look at our first case study, which is uh, migration. John, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon. I, I don't know, a combination of lunch and listening to so many ideas is putting me in danger of rather forgetting my own. Uh, so I will fumble my way through, I, I hope, what I think is one of the really central challenges for, for addressing what we are discussing this morning about the, the rise of, of, of populist forces. Uh, and I think it is very squarely, 
impossible to exaggerate even the extent to which this is essentially about uh, migration policy and why I think at the moment um, it's all heading in, in, a, in a fairly calamitous direction, which is not to say, however, because I promise some optimism, that this need necessarily be the case. Uh, that there is, in fact, a way of, of tackling this issue that, that will go to the heart of, of Europe's current political crises. But anyway, here we are sitting in, in Boston. But let, let's take you to Paris or, or Berlin. Uh, and you are surrounded by countries in which there are four interior ministers, Austria, Poland, Hungary, Italy, that have exactly the same policy platform as the AfD or Le Pen on key issues, on European integration, on human rights, attitudes to Trump, and, and migration. And, and this emerging political family, moreover, is highly organized, highly professional. They own social media in a way that no mainstream political party has even begun to, to comprehend. Uh, they are united. And the most important thing about them is they have a simple, compelling, hugely seductive story. And we've had one component of the story about the little man losing out to globalization. It's a sub-story. The central story is hyper simple. Europe is facing a barbarian invasion, and I am the only person who is ruthless enough, who has the will to stop it. That is the narrative. Let me give a couple of quotes on, on this from, from, from Dear Victor. Uh, this is from April or July this year. If everything continues this way, then the cities of Europe will clearly have majority Muslim populations. If things continue like this, our culture, our identity, and our nations as we know them will cease to exist. Our worst nightmares will have become reality. The West will fall. Simple, it's clear, and people buy it. And then he goes the response. We are not sheep who quietly stand around waiting for their fate to be visited upon them. Naturally, we shall fight. And if someone does not refrain from their dangerous plans, we shall simply expel them. Okay, so it's quite clear. It resonates hugely. And mainstream political establishment has no response to this story whatsoever. It has no narrative, and worse, it has no policies that substantiate a different story. Now, these parties have made it abundantly clear that the European parliamentary elections is basically going to be a plebiscite on migration. They've announced it, they've declared it, they will run with it, they're hugely confident about it, and they will do very well. They will do very well, unless, and, I, and I'll get there in a minute. And what do I mean by very well? Just, to, I mean, I, I try and get the right balance between not being too complacent and not panicking either. But I mean, the threshold that people need to worry about with the EU uh, for, for the, the, the political power, the majorities that, that these forces get, it's not 50%. It's about 25, 30. It's enough to paralyze institutions. It's enough to freeze any ability to engage with conversations or punitive mechanisms in relation to rule of law developments, rights developments in those countries. For that, they don't need 50%. They need enough to paralyze the machinery so they can get on with and do in their national environments what they, what they want to do. Uh, so, so I come back to the central challenge. If that immense likelihood is to be averted, a broad political mainstream, from a social democrat to a Christian democrat, needs to, to coalesce around a, um, a story and policies on migration. Uh, that, and and why, where do they struggle? Because they're deeply confused about the phenomenon of migration. They're schizophrenic uh, about the kind of policies that, that they need to adopt. And the left and right for, for, for different reasons. And I'll try and come back to this at the end, because I think there's a, a, a colossal struggle within the left, managing and understanding how to be pragmatic, and within the right, trying to understand that somewhere along the lines, if you're going to talk about values, you're going to offer an idealistic vision of what Europe is, you need to demonstrate that with policies that are actually like that. 
and actually do it, uh, and, and, and they can't. Uh, but to um, look at some of the key, the key myths, the first one, the Orban uh, myth, the populist narrative, the invasion. Uh, this is central to how the whole issue is framed. There are 1.2 billion Africans today. There are going to be 2 million in 50 years' time. They're all coming here. And it's just palpably untrue. It is just palpably untrue. Even at the height of the, of the chaos in, in Libya that facilitated a route through the central Mediterranean, it was 150,000 a year tops. Far too many, far too many for the limits of Europeans and certainly Italy's social empathy. But not uh, uh, an invasion for sure. The 2015 Syrian uh, influx, again, was obviously an exceptional set of, of circumstances. I mean, it's worth recalling that Africa went from about 350 million in 1970 to 1 1.2 billion today, and that hasn't provoked a, a, a colossal influx. Uh, the strange thing is, in fact, that the story of the invasion is often actually also a narrative that's reinforced by the left. The left also talks about it. And then it gets misled and distracted by, we need to address the root causes. But every time they talk about root causes, which is clearly not going to solve anything in the time frame that anyone needs, it reinforces the idea, oh my god, there are just millions, there are just millions that are coming. Uh, and that, I think, is, a, is a, a deeply unhelpful story that many even liberally minded people are, are, are perpetuate. The, the second fallacy, the fallacy that's central to the, the, the the populative narrative, but one that is cherished by a, a liberal left, which I self-identify with, to use a ghastly expression, uh, is you can't control migration. It's a balloon. You squeeze one bit, it pops out in another. You just have to manage it, legalize it, regularize it in one way. And the problem with this, to use a good English expression, is that it's bollocks. It's totally untrue, as Orban and Salvini have again demonstrated. You can control migration. You can stop it incredibly well if you are prepared to be pretty cruel. The Australians do it. They do it with Nauru. Uh, Salvini has done it by removing every single boat in the Mediterranean, perpetuating Miniti's arrangements with, with Libya. You can stop migration. You can stop it incredibly, incredibly well. Um, then there are Two more, I think, real canards in this, in, the, in this room of, again, different ones advocated, one by a mainstream left, one by a mainstream right, around, well, what will make all this anxiety go away if it's not the numbers? And, and, the, and the left, and we heard a little bit of it this morning, thinks that, well, this is very economic anxiety-induced paranoia, and you know, we can address a little bit of inequality and give people greater economic aspirations, well, then their anxieties about migration will go away. I mean, this is just, again, empirically, spectacularly false. Every study you look at, you look at the demographics of who mines, you look at previous migration crises, whether that was US 94, whether that was Spain, Canary Islands 2006, whether that was Italy 2008, whether that was Nauru 2001, Nauru 2011. It doesn't matter the swings in an economic cycle. Uh, Economic anxieties and migration-related concerns are, are totally separate. The, the last one that I wanted to dwell on a little bit is that, and this is cherished very much by a right, is that it's a numbers game. And that if you can bring down the numbers, the concern will go away. And if we can just bring down the numbers, this populists have got nothing to talk about. Uh, and, and this, again, is also just fundamentally false. They've got an incredibly sticky story. And this sticky story has stuck. And they say, you take me away, and they are back. These hordes are back. So just relying on the numbers, I'm like Donald Tusk, the commission, Juncker, you can even hear Merkel saying it sometimes. Macron likes to say, oh, it's done. It's really not a problem anymore. It won't wash, and it won't wash with an electorate. And if that is their strategy going into the European elections, the parliamentary elections, they will, they will have a very rough time of it. Uh, so I come back. What does a rival story look like? What is the story that they need to be telling on, on migration? 
It's one, we do not face an invasion. We faced an exceptional phenomenon, and now we face a manageable problem. A problem, because we must control borders, and the left needs to make peace with this fact. Uh, but we will manage these borders humanely, because we are not like Orban. We are not like Salvini. The kind of values that are central to a humane, migration policy is what defines us as Europeans. Now this story, this is a good story. You can sell that story, but you can't sell it, because a number of people are telling this story, if you haven't got policies that people believe will do these things. So then the ultimate question becomes, for pretty well everyone is, including a, the kind of rights universe that I come from, but that really struggles with is what does an effective but humane migration border control policy look like? How do you do control with soul? Can you do it? Uh, and I wrote notes in lots of different places in my book, so I found them. Uh, that, that is the key question. Let me quickly look at a couple of the ones on the table at the moment. which are all essentially a combination of irrelevant, unworkable, or unsellable policies. And most of these have an EU label attached to them. Frontex, 10,000 border guards, and they're going to solve everything, except they're going to solve absolutely nothing, because neither Italy nor Spain actually wants these people doing anything on their, on their borders. So again, this is a, a fantasy solution. Dublin reform. Dublin reform is the biggest political red herring there's ever been. And it's a deeply <laughs> politically damaging red herring. You're going to create a system that insists that some country that will make no numerical difference whatsoever to a migration problem, Hungary, takes 1,000 people. It's not solving anyone's problem if Hungary takes 1,000 people. But you're creating a huge political rumpus. And in any case, if history has taught us anything about migration, the business of moving people against their will to a supposedly receiving country that has no interest in receiving them does not work. For which reason, in fact, Dublin, even its existing format, never worked either. Okay, the other kind of fantasy solution, African platforms. We can find some external processing centers, uh, and if we pay enough people, uh, we can dump everyone there. I mean, this is legally virtually impossible. This is administratively immensely difficult. It'll be hugely costly. And for the purposes of what I'm talking about, the kind of narrative you need, impossible to reconcile with any kind of value-driven migration uh, policy. Uh, so none of those things are going to work. But what have you got at the moment? You've got a migration policy, a border control policy, that has indeed brought numbers down from a peak of 1.8 million in 2015, and, and, and that's less, um, to 90,000 so far this year through a good deal very badly implemented between the EU and Turkey, which sees appalling conditions on Lesbos, but actually no one's being returned at all. Uh, and a very bad deal with Libya Implemented very well. No one really gets across anymore in any significant numbers, but the price of that is you've sunk contracted your border control to people who will bring them back to a country in which people will be abused, tortured, extorted, and every other manner of unspeakable things will, will happen to, to them. So what do we have? We have borders closed cruelly, undermining a mainstream's ability to project any kind of value-driven policy or claim to, to, to humanity. And this is a massive problem because the winners are the populists. They say, I have solved it, and I am the only one who backs the policies that are actually doing it. The left, the right, can't criticize the policies because they back them. And the left, well, it criticizes the policies, but it doesn't have an alternative. So as populists have clicked, if you offer people a choice between open borders and closed ones, closed cruelly, they will choose cruel closed borders. So the last one, I'll quickly rush through a little bit of what a, a different system might actually look like and, and how you might get there. And I, I don't claim that it's it's very, very uh, easy thing to do, but, it, but it's doable because all its components exist somewhere. 
But if you're going to have a system that respects key red lines, that guarantees access to territory, fair asylum proceedings, respects rights to, uh, to, to, to asylum, doesn't return people to, to dangerous places, you need to really significantly change Europe's current existing asylum system. And the vehicle for changing that is not the EU, because the EU will not get the agreement that you need that would put the necessary infrastructure in place. So indeed, it's a coalition of willing states. That would need to address two fundamental things, the length of proceedings, so let's take Italy. The average length of an asylum determination proceeding from beginning to end in Italy is 1,813 days. Not a good deal for anyone. And most, time, most of whom have disappeared in that time. You then get to the second problem, which is that virtually no one is returned. So between 2014, 2017, 27,404 people came, arrived in Italy from Senegal. 768 got some kind of protection. Uh, and 335 people were returned, right? If you reach Europe, you have reached Europe and you will stay. That makes Europe, if you count then all the deaths of this, a hugely deadly magnet, right? So that has to change. The elements that need to change it, fast asylum decisions in, yes, closed for most centers in Europe, not in some fantasy land in, in Africa, in Europe. Two months from beginning to end uh, returns to either countries of origin or indeed third countries for refugees like Turkey, where standards are genuinely met. Getting return agreements that actually work require you to address the interests of that country. All right. Uh, at the moment, we have that Europe is the champion of nominal return agreements. You need proper ones that offer regular migration in return and a series of other incentives that are structured as being applicable from day X. Not that everyone who is here now from Senegal can still be returned. From the 1st of January 2019, the people passing through the system who do not get asylum are, are returned. And then thirdly, you need a system for relocation of refugees, not asylum seekers, who have passed through this system to other, other countries. So you're not relocating, and it's not a, an obligatory system, it's a voluntary one. Um, it's not of asylum seekers, it's of refugees. So you'd need Spain, France to join in for the centers. You'd need the Italy, Switzerland, Germany to accept a relocation, create an EU integration fund. And then you're beginning to have the elements of a story that doesn't solve all the issues, because that can never happen. But you have a policy that you can sell that is the most humane one that is viable. Uh, yeah, that's it, the most humane one that is viable. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And you're not you know, imposing this on people who, 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 who don't want it. Um, so so, so where, do I, where do I end up? Uh, you know, much of this is quite obvious. What's difficult about it? It's difficult for the left because it's hugely disapproved by a liberal intelligentsia of which I was <coughs> formerly, currently, I don't know, part, connected to in some way, uh, who can't abide by detention. Indeed, the whole idea of returning anyone at all is, is anathema. So they really struggle with it. And the right struggles with it because, well, why should I do something that's immensely complicated requires legal reform, administrative reform, is going to be quite expensive, will result in the ad admission of more people than currently when everyone has accepted something really awful already. So why should I do it? Because they think they're not losing, but, and this is my argument, they're wrong. They are losing because they're not getting the reward for these policies at all. It is populists they're getting. So my conclusion. A mainstream, a right, needs to get a little bit more idealistic. A left needs to get a little bit more pragmatic. And if you can create that consensus, you will get policies that I think align with where a majority of European public opinion actually is, which is not infinite empathy, but not complete assholes either. There you go. OK.
thank you, John, for this uh, Promethean effort to find solutions to the migration crisis. Uh, Kyriakos, I have to ask you now for um, discipline with time, because otherwise we wouldn't have much time for questions. So our second case study, which is Greece. Thank you. Uh, I originally had the presentation, but I'm not going to use a presentation, exactly because you asked me to be optimistic and the presentation would have been extremely gloomy. Um, now, uh, the presentation is on Greece, um, and uh, the Greek focus comes into play after the completion of the third memorandum of the third bailout package uh, last August. We have officially entered the new era. Uh, by the way, I particularly enjoyed uh, a quote by Sigmar Gabriel before, where he was speaking about following rules in Germany, uh, how Germany has rules, and unfortunately they always follow them. In Greece we have rules, and unfortunately we often don't follow them, but fortunately we sometimes also don't follow them, and that was the case of the catastrophic referendum of 2015, uh, which we were lucky enough not to follow uh, with some, we, we, we developed our own policy space in terms of referendum result interpretations. Um, and uh, now uh, we have to achieve growth rates which will allow us uh, to basically exist as a sovereign state in this new era. Um, Greece has formal, um, requirements to achieve vis-a-vis -vis its primary budget surplus. It will have to be at very high levels for the coming decades. We have a very high debt coming out of the crisis. Um, as an organization, uh, we believe, and we have written extensively on this, that this growth rate that is predicted for Greece for the next years, this 2%, needs to be much higher, actually, in order to achieve the, the targets. Uh, we need to achieve something in the area of 3 even 4%, uh, and this is going to be a huge challenge to do so. So one of the things that we're trying to focus on is how we could do this, uh, focusing on different sectors of the Greek economy, going to the nitty gritty details uh, from our energy policy to our cruise industry policy, and how an accumulation of different changes would achieve these results. Um, Tony Barber of the Financial Times wrote an article recently in the Financial Times comparing the UK and Greece, uh, also speaking about the referenda in the different countries. Uh, and he sounded really optimistic that Greece had managed uh, to basically exit the crisis not that wounded. Um, this was after a, a meeting that we had at Ditchley Park at Oxford, uh, where I had the chance to present some data on the basis of an annual value survey that we do in Greece called What Greeks Believe. And what basically, to strike, a, to strike an optimistic note, uh, felt really uh, interesting was the fact that seven in ten Greeks are pro-Euro uh, and pro-EU right now. This was not the case last year. This was not the case two years ago. So the pro-European camp has reached its pre-crisis level, almost its pre-crisis levels. So this felt like a really good thing to write about. Uh, the problem is that this stability uh, is potentially very fragile. Um, 2019 is going to be a year of multiple elections in Greece. We will have regional elections, we will have European elections, we will have uh, national elections probably, unless they happen by the end of the year, which they probably won't. And we also have a presidential election at the beginning of 2020, which can as easily happen in 2019. So uh, we will need to have a stable government come out of this election and the presidential majority. Uh, political instability was the primary reason why Greece needed three bailout packages <laughs> instead of less. Uh, so a re-injection of political instability will obviously affect very much the, the prospects of the country. Now, I was originally planning to talk about the existential challenges in terms of achieving this uh, 3 or 4% that I spoke about before. I'm going to speak about two such uh, challenges. Um, as an organization, we have outlined four, um, but there's not enough time to speak about all of them. Um, the biggest one is the demographic challenge that Greece is facing, and in effect, this demographic challenge is a youth challenge, a challenge of the Greek youth. And the second one is much less tangible. Uh, it's a challenge of social cohesion, a social capital crisis, in a sense. The other two that one could talk about are the cl climate change issues that Greece is going to face significantly, we have one such study on our website, and the necessary productivity adaptations to what people describe as the fourth industrial revolution, because many jobs are being lost in Greece right now, not because of the crisis, but because of the implementation of technological change. Let's focus on the first two, demographics. 
We have one uh, quite problematic demographic reality right now, uh, the fact that the Greek population for the first time after the war declined. Uh, in 2011, we were 11.1 million. Now we are 10.7 million. Uh, this has happened for a set of reasons. Uh, deaths are more than births right now. This happened during the crisis. But the primary reason, the primary driver of this effect is migration. It's what we describe as the brain drain uh, effect. 400,000 Greeks or even more uh, left the country. This was not the case in the previous decades. In the previous decades, population increased because of migration. Greece never had the baby boom like other countries. Take the 1990s, the net population increases in Greece in the 1990s. The net population increase was 580,000. The contribution of births was 50,000. The contribution of incoming migration uh, was uh, 530,000, basically stemming from Albania. Uh, now this effect is, has changed. Why is this significant? Well, it is significant because, first of all, demography and economics interact. Uh, and since we're trying to achieve high growth rates, if one looks at different studies of countries that manage to achieve very high growth rates, we typically had the economically active population of those countries increasing at least by 2% a year. The reality in Greece is that not only will we have uh, a decline in the economically active population, we will have a decline in the total population. So it's like trying to run, but having an opposite wind. Uh, and this is, going to be, this is going to affect us. What we tried to do as an organization was to bring over some, some demographers that we uh, trust and work with and develop scenarios, do a big demographic study vis-a-vis -vis the prospects of Greece after the, uh, after the crisis. The population right now is 10.7 million. So what will the population be in 2050? That was the question that we asked them. Um, they developed six scenarios. The best case scenario is 10 million in 2050. That's the dream scenario. Uh, very low probability to achieve it. The worst case scenario is 8.3 million. The median scenario is not between those two numbers. The most probable scenario is 8.8 .8 million, according to the projections. So the most probable projection is that we will lose a further 2 million in terms of our population. The challenge is not only vis-a-vis -vis the number, it's also vis-a-vis -vis the composition of the number. Because one, when one looks at uh, how many Greeks are over the age of 65 today, they are 21% of the population. They will be 30 to 33% of the population in 2050. So this challenge has a full set of implications. Uh, the obvious one is the pension system, but there are some less obvious ones vis-a-vis -vis economic growth, um, even schools policy, even all the different areas that will be affected by this problem. One of the reasons why this uh, bad equilibrium is also taking place is the Greek youth. And this is why I mentioned that the real crisis is a youth crisis. How many children per couple in Greece right now? 1.3. And if one looks further at the profile of the Greek youth from an accumulation of all the other studies that we conducted, and some of them we had a chance to discuss them last night, take extreme poverty in Greece. Uh, we wanted to do a study on extreme poverty because the relative poverty metrics don't tell you a lot because relative poverty is 60% of the median income. Of the median income, the median income drops. The relative poverty numbers more or less re remain the same during the crisis. So one of the things we wanted to look at was Okay, how many are really poor? Because there was a lot, you know, there are populist rhetoric, et cetera, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, how many were poor. Before the crisis, extremely poor, 2.2% of the population in 2008. The number ignited to 17% of the population in 2013, and it has been dropping a little bit ever since. Now it's 13.5%, 13.5. Why am I mentioning this? Who are the extremely poor in Greece? If you, look, if you turn on a Greek television channel, uh, all rhetoric is on pensions. But in the age groups of over 65, extremely poor are 1 in 40. If you look at the age group of those who are in the age categories of 18 to 29, it's 1 in 4. And I'm not referring to people who live with their parents. Uh, basically, this is using our own data set uh, and European data sets. So we're looking at people who live independently. Um, we also implemented a big European project called QPES under the supervision of the University of Heidelberg, which tried to look at the transmission of values within families. Um, and we asked a series of questions to the Greek youth and also to the young people of other countries. Under the age of 35, 
which is the Greek version of youth. In Germany, this was not perceived as very young, but we forced them to increase the number. Um, so um, question asked, what's your primary source of income? In Greece, the primary source of income was not a job. We're referring to people who are up to 35. The primary source of income was the family. Mom and dad, grandpa and grandma. Not my job. The second one was my job, and there was a difference between them. What was the only country out of the 11 uh, this uh, survey was conducted in which this was the reality? Greece. Uh, and we asked a series of other questions. Of course, we, with regards to are you planning to move out of the country, and three in four Greeks replied, yes, I would consider it. Also the highest number in the poll. So if one adds up all those data points with regards to the Greek youth, this is an existential challenge. And this is very much an existential challenge going forward in all the different facets uh, of this issue. I also mentioned the social capital and uh, values uh, challenge. And one of, the, uh, one of the studies for which we're most, uh, I would say, famous abroad uh, and in local embassies in Greece is a survey that we do every year called What Greeks Believe. I cited a number from that survey before with regards uh, to how much Greeks appreciate uh, their participation in the EU. And it's interesting to conduct that survey every year because you see trends, you see differences, how, things, how the needle moves every year. So yes, now we're again very much pro-European, but there are other issues which we find problematic. Uh, I would, let me pick one uh, to start with. Uh, should, will Greece get out of the crisis with a plan, with a very solid growth plan, or with a strong leader? The majority replies, marginally, but they reply with a strong leader. When we asked who does the, who does the strong leader look like, who should it look like, and we put the names of foreign uh, political leaders, I think you can guess who is first. It's Vladimir Putin with 30%. The highest number, the second highest number is Angela Merkel with 14%. So. We are seeing a change towards the more autocratic, I would say, uh, on, many, on many answers. It's very interesting that I had a debate uh, last year with the former head of YouGov comparing notes uh, with regards to the results of the study, the, the British referendum and, and this study. And it's interesting that what he mentioned that the most pro-European elements of society in the UK are the young. In Greece, it's exactly the opposite. The most pro-European answers are received by the pensioners, not the young. The young were those who much more significantly wanted figures like Vladimir Putin uh, to be people that Greek politicians should resemble. Um, also, vis-a-vis -vis reforms, we're seeing there are some positive things that we see in that poll and some negative things. The positive ones, two out of three Greeks believe that the state intervenes too much in the economy. That's a majority even amongst the voters of the Greek Communist Party, which tells a lot about the Greek state. Um, so that's positive. Two in three Greeks want uh, for the state to have the capacity to fire public servants, which we still cannot, according to the Constitution. So those are positive things, but there are negative things as well. If I had to pick the most significant out of the negative uh, issues, and this is why I mentioned the social cohesion crisis. In the context of this work, we implemented the World Values Survey for Greece this year. And among the questions in the World Values Survey, you have questions on institutional trust, and you have questions on societal trust. Um, the only institutions that we trust a lot, we trust our families, which we also consider an institution, and that's interesting, 98% trust. We trust the Greek army. The numbers on the Greek army have increased a lot, 80%. We trust the Greek police, very high, 75%. Political parties are in the area of 10%. The parliament is in the area of 20%. Institutional trust in Greece is very low. We had the lowest trust indicators in the European Union before the crisis, and we've lost a further 10 points on average. But what is most interesting is not the institutional trust indicators alone. It's a question implemented in the World Value Survey which says, are other people trustworthy in general, according to your view? So you ask this question in Sweden, and you get a reply of yes in the area of 60%. You ask the question in Germany, and yes is 44%. You go south in Spain, and yes becomes 19%. You go further south in Turkey, and it's 11%. And you go to Greece, and it's 8.4%, the lowest number in the World Values Survey. So there are many people here who have worked on social capital and on social capital for Greece. 
this is an existential issue as well, because uh, social cohesion plays a huge role for economic growth. It has been proven. And coming out of the crisis, we had the problem in that area, but that problem is now much more significant than before. To conclude with one brief thought on what uh, types of issues we should be measuring and where we should be focusing. Um, the memorandum was a plan for Greece, the bailout packages. We, one of the things that we did, one of the most actually famous uh, things that we did in Greece was to take a specific conditionality tranche of the third bailout, the third tranche of the third bailout. It had 140 measures. And we rewrote them in plain Greek so that the population could understand them because even us couldn't understand all of them. They were written in a very technical lingo. If one looks at those 140 measures, the 138 are positive, purely positive. Only one uh, mentioned uh, dimin about diminishing pensions, and another one uh, affected uh, increasing taxation. The 138 were positive. There were measures inside the memorandum, which even, one example. Political parties in Greece cannot take loans from Greek banks on the basis of their future electoral performance. <laughs> Something which we should have legislated alone. So most of the measures are that were of that nature. Now, we don't have one such plan in place. The fact that we needed that plan reflected that we weren't able as a political system and as a society to create our own plan of national ownership. And this is exactly what we still need right now. The issue is that this plan should focus on the existential issues that we have. And I will always remember an article uh, written by Thomas Friedman at the beginning of the crisis. He came to Greece. Uh, he met the then Prime Minister, George Papandreou. It was, the it was May 2010, one week after the signing of the first memorandum, if I'm not mistaken. He met the then Prime Minister, and then we had all that technical jargon which, had, uh, which was injected in uh, the Greek public vocabulary, the spreads from the, Bundes bond, uh, from the German bonds, etc. And what Friedman wrote was the following. I'm not going to be looking at any of that data. I'm going to be looking at what young Greeks will be doing so if you see them leaving the country, start selling Greek bonds. If you see them staying and some of them coming back, then it's the time to start investing again. And I think that this line of thinking has been fully justified since, and we need to start focusing on the elephant in the room rather than on the marginal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiriakos, for an extremely interesting uh, talk. What strikes me immediately is that, you know, after the very strong, incredibly strong medicines that Greece got throughout, after the crisis and through the years, the two issues that you are here um, focusing on, they are quite common for many societies. I mean, as a matter of fact, they are the problems all our societies face, demography and social cohesion. Um, would you say that the problem is not so much economic, of economic nature, but more cultural? This is my first question. And second, why, if the analysis is there, political parties, governments are not doing anything? For instance, in the demographic uh, issue. And maybe also to you, Vivian, if you want to talk. I mean, obviously, there are many cult more cultural elements than economic elements, but if I, if I accept this, then this also means that the solutions will have to be very long term and the problem is very difficult, is extremely difficult to fix. And I want to be an optimist. So in a sense, in the long run, culture affects institutions, but in the short run, politicians affect institutions as well. So it, it's the chicken and egg problem. So I strongly believe that even though we have cultural issues, and it's also interesting, if I, if I may cite one more piece of data which was very fun uh, for us to find out, the Greek dream uh, traditionally was for a young Greek to work in the Greek public sector. So I found polling before the crisis asking uh, young Greeks, how many of you want to work in the Greek public sector? 40% said yes, it was the first choice. That number dropped to 20% in 2015. So we were very happy, things are changing. And now it's back at 30. So culture is very difficult to change. That's what I'm trying to claim. Political parties have found it very difficult to do things on this because the philosophy of approaching the demographic problem has fiscal elements and regulatory elements which contradict the very nature of the memorandum intervention. Uh, if you look at France, which has healthy demographics, I mean, France has healthy demographics because of its history, because of Northern Africa, etc. But in reality, we need, we need a set of measures which we, which we didn't have the fiscal space to implement 
uh, if you, I mean, most of our demographers say that you need to, to, to regulate, you need to, to, to create measures for the age groups of 2029 and help them with the rents, help them with uh, preschool education, etc. We have developed a policy. Political parties have now started talking about this in Greece, but it's, it's purely a function of capability, nothing, nothing more. Uh, yes, yes. So you've answered for Greece. Now I want to raise the question also for other European member states, in particular Germany. It's also the response to the crisis was also a, about culture or ideas. And here you've got to take the sort of ordo liberal philosophy of German. So for, for Germany, this was all about debt. And it's unfortunate for how the crisis evolved that everyone bought into the German narrative of the crisis, starting with Greece, it's all about debt. So you start with uh, misframing of the crisis as bad debt, rather a public debt as opposed to private, then a misdiagnosis in terms of, well, if it's about bad debt, public debt, then it's about behavior. And therefore, we have to make everyone follow the rules and double down on the rules, as opposed to recognizing it was a problem of the structure of the euro and divergence rather than convergence. But for the Germans in particular on the cultural side, it's about a worldview that says, look, it's about stability. Everyone needs stability. And the problem for the Eurozone as a whole is you bring in the, Euro, the European semester, you, you've already had the Stability and Growth Pact, et cetera, um, and it doesn't work. It's not, a, it doesn't work for growth. And if we think about what, what actually happens, so it's not just about culture, it's also about institutions, failed states, if we want to actually say. Um, but it's also about timing. Because what you see in the EU is a recognition that actually after a while, recognition it doesn't work. All you have to do is look at the headline goals uh, in the European semester. Number one was fiscal consolidation. Number two was structural reform. Number three was do whatever you can to think about your, the EU 2020 goals and think about poverty and all of the nicer things. Um, what you see over time is a recognition. This isn't working because when you do headline goal number one is fiscal consolidation, most political parties recognizing this immediately don't have, the, don't have the space, the time, to be able to actually engage in the kinds of reforms they need to, in particular in countries like Greece, also Italy, but with Berlusconi problem. Um, but so number one was fiscal consolidation, highly problematic, and that remained the headline goal from 2011 to 2014. Uh, structural <coughs> reform was number two. This is in the annual growth service. Structural reform was number two in the headline goals, and it starts out in 2011 by basically crush the unions, you know, because the idea is you need flexible markets. By 2014, it was bring in the social partners, do whatever you can to actually make this thing work. By 20. 15, with Juncker coming in, the whole thing flips, and it's investment. And I think if, if you look over time, what you see is that people recognize that um, it simply wasn't working. And then I have a whole other discussion of what you see then is a reinterpretation of the rules by stealth, because given the institutional rules in the EU, once you have the treaties, once you have the rules, you can't change them. And then you end up with a commission that has a strict, um, harsh austerity and structural reform discourse at the same time that they are increasingly flexible. Uh, it, Italy and France get derogations of the rules, two years and then another two years. Spain gets a recalculation of its uh, whatever it was, primary surplus, is deficit because of the unemployment, et cetera. And so what you see is sort of under the radar, there's, there's a reinterpretation of the rules to make things work better, but at the same time a discourse, which means that you, it becomes delegitimizing in every single way. The Spaniards continue to feel oppressed even when they're accommodated, and the Germans feel deceived regardless. And I think so it's, it's more than culture. It's about ideas, it's about institutions, it's about changes over time that make things, try to make things work, but even then, you still end up with suboptimal rules and problems of legitimacy. So we'll open up now for discussion. Um, are there any questions?
çok var. Optimism today in Europe sounds really a very peculiar <laughs> way. Uh, I have a question to you. Um, we are thinking about either collapse of the European Union or some ways of uh, reforming it, moving forward. Uh, is there a way to strategically retreat from what we have? Is, is there a mid midway solution before between you know total collapse and some series of innovative reforms uh, inventions and so on and if, if there is a, a strategic retreat what that could be in what domains in what areas Should I respond? oh yeah okay great I uh, know wonderful question but I think um, Part of the reason I get to differentiated integration and a soft core with overlapping, you know, multiple clusters of member states in different policy communities is that different member states can then take leadership, a leadership role in different areas. So security and defense, it would be uh, obviously France, possibly Germany, Poland, and maybe the UK. Uh, in um, in terms of, of can you, that would be moving forward. But then in terms of retreat, the question would be for the Eurozone. You know, is retreat possible? And in one way, the European semester is already becoming more and more flexible. Is that enough? Well, probably not. But there, you've got suboptimal rules. So the question becomes, is there going to be a will, a political will and leadership to move forward if they if there is? as we've already heard today, it's got to be done very fast because after 2019, it's not going to happen. And so if that doesn't happen, if you don't get the risk sharing, if you don't get serious instruments at the EU level to stabilize the euro, then I think you probably will see a kind of strategic retreat. But what that means, uh, some people suggest parallel currencies that slowly unwind the euro for any number of member states, whereas other, others go deeper and, 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 and provide budget. You'll still have a euro, but you may have different euro zones in the euro. How that works, I have no idea. We need to bring in the economists for that, if it can work. But, um, you know, there's no easy answer, but what it means is the EU stays together. You still have a single market, but you have different things going on in different spheres, more, less. You have innovation. I love your suggestion. You know, if only there would be the leadership capability to do it. I mean, so I, I think we come back down to leadership, new narratives um, that get us out of this. But, you know, that's either for strategic... Uh, retreat or moving forward, but it's different in different domains. I agree with Vivian, um, last um, part. And, you know, relating to optimism in the EU, no, in Europe right now, there is also the self-fulfilling prophecy problem here. And of course there are a lot of problems, but there are also bright lights and the capability to solve the problems. I think this is the main issue, which is leadership and, um, you know, decision-making efficiency. Europe has shown, in my eyes, in the last years, that it was able to solve at least some of the problems it had. I mean, if you look at the financial crisis, it was, you know, not perfectly done, and it was very lengthy. But at the end, the results, in economic terms, haven't been, hasn't been that bad. I mean, if you look at Portugal, if you look at Ireland, if you look at even the Greek case, Spain, um, you know, in economic terms, I think the solutions took long, but it hasn't been that bad in my eyes. Uh, I think the problems are broader and the capability, you know, this is the situation. Sorry? for 10 years. Well, we have, we have the, big, the big financial crisis. You know, we have, we have a crisis similar to 29. And you have, after 10 years, something which seems to work. But look what happened in the United States. 
covered in two years. <laughs> well, you have a different system. And the consequences have been worse in the U.S. than Europe, even. As we know. I have a question to John Dalvos, Carl Kaiser Commission School. If I understand you correctly, you want to counteract the narrative uh, of the barbarians are coming by creating what you call a more humane management, right? Of the, of the border issue. Now, how will you escape that devilish consequence that the more humane you are, the stronger the pull eff 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 effect is, and you attract even more migrants to come. In other words, may have the opposite effect when it comes to you, the people uh, who argue the barbarians are coming. There will be more. So my <laughs> question to you is, wouldn't it better to invent something to help them to stay? Well, then the point is that you need a system that reduces the numbers that are coming, but does this through disincentivizing the journey, not by treating them miserably en route, right? So, and the vehicle for that is the prospect of return. So it's return. This is the, this is the, the magic uh, potion. I mean, what is the formula that enables you to return two categories of people? One. Uh, those that don't have a claim to international protection anyway. They don't need it. The, irreg the irregular economic migrant. And if you can return promptly and regularly, you can discourage a journey. Because why would you spend $5,000, three months of your life, risk your life on that journey if you are very confident that you would be returned? So that's the the game of incentives you play with them. Then the other lot is obviously this doesn't accommodate the real refugee. And then obviously your question becomes, well, for the refugee, what is the extent to which you are incentivizing a refugee to take that journey if you're offering them the prospect of a very rapid uh, determination and a very rapid transfer to integration in a European country that you might actually want to live in as a, as a refugee? And that's quite a fair point. Uh, and then the question to that becomes, well, look, how have you managed it with Turkey, except for the fact that it's not being implemented properly? Uh, but you know, what are then the periphery spaces that get you to see the business of refugee protection as not being about simply let them come unto us, where you're seeing the primary concern is being how can I contribute to the existence of multiple spaces, some of which have to be with me too, because I have to take my fair share, uh, but that are more widely distributed across the world, where countries have an interest, like Turkey has an interest, in admitting those that have transited through it. And so how do you do that for, for other routes and with other, with other countries? And, and again, that should not trigger a pull factor. Now, obviously, the concern is if you simply say, we reopen the central Mediterranean route, we open up the islands, let everyone back onto the mainland and wander through Europe as they want, and we return to the asylum system status quo ante, then clearly you're saying, let's return to open borders. And that's the calamity precisely that Orban it, it plays on. Yes. I don't convince you. We'll take no, three questions. Okay. Okay. Um, the panel will finish. Yours, yours, please. Thank you. Ines from Weiter Cells and MIT. Um, my question also goes to you, John. Um, you spoke about, uh, how did you uh, frame it? Um, a fair asylum system through a coalition of willing states. And then you laid out what, what that um, would entail in, in detail. Now, I suppose my question is, how does that work with the fundamental freedoms, in particular you know, with the Schengen system? And then actually sort of using that specific example, um, this would then go to Vivian's point about clusters. Can we actually have clusters when it comes to the fundamental freedoms? Or is this something that we have to you know, limit to specific areas, such as finance or you know? I, I, I don't see why it'd be at all non-national from one jurisdiction to another within the EU isn't prevented by anything that exists in, a, in, a, in existing EU law. So we could do it. And in fact, it happens all the time uh, in, in lots of other circumstances. Um, you know, prison transfers is a 
very good example, um, including often a foreign national, which is not something lots of people know about, but that happens too. Uh, so, I mean, you could, you could do it, right? And then the, the, the question is, everything that I'm talking about would be probably be simpler if you had a straightforward European, common European asylum system, single rules, single administration, did the whole thing. Uh, from processing to transfer to... But I mean, it, that is a huge undertaking. H how to integrate the business of attributing a refugee status that involves appeals all along the way. So it's not just an administrative procedure, it's a judicial proceeding as well in the end. And how you would integrate that into an EU judicial ecosystem is not wholly straightforward, even if there was the political will to do it, right? So it's just not going to happen right now. So particularly the Germans need to get out of this obsession with seeing that every European problem that needs a European solution must have an EU solution. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fallacy. Yeah, European solution can be a collaborative, you know, coordinated steps taken by sovereign nation states. Now, you could do that within the kind of umbrella arrangements, kind of subgroups uh, that would do it within an EU infrastructure. Uh, so, so you could also do it that way. But even that, it doesn't have to even be that. Uh, it's just seven or eight countries that go, hmm, we have a problem. We have a big problem. How can we cooperate in a way that would solve this problem for us sufficiently to address the colossal leaking of support that we've got from a European public. Do we have five minutes more? Yeah. Uh, there was a question here. Sorry. Is, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mary Anding Weather Heart Center. Um, so we now have actually a rich body of literature in political science showing how um, European countries plus the US in a way um, find different ways to give incentives to potential migrants to stay <coughs> home, right? Be it bilateral aid, um, multilateral aid, and using institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, whatnot. Um, so my question is going to be um, whether you think these strategies are working, and well, that's, that was a straight no, and if you think it's an ethical way of um, actually solving the issue of, of migration. You mean to return home or stay at home? Stay home as a preemptive um, Precautious in a way. I, mean, I, I, I honestly don't understand this. Kind of somehow okay, you can, the, the, the idea that you can somehow in, incentivize someone, to, you can disincentivize someone from traveling, I think. Disinti in a way, because. But that's different to incentivizing someone to stay. Because so, I think the whole conversation around root causes and development and that's going. So it, the issue, the assumption is. is People move when the economic um, crisis hits the country, right? The welfare, the prosperity decreases, and so what they do is there's a large network of diaspora in country X, and that's where they will pro probably potentially move to. And so when, let's say, Germany or let's say mm, the UK, in the case of the UK, there are a lot of Romanians already living in the UK, and so Romania being a potential migrant sending country would probably receive larger loans from the IMF because they want the economic situation in Romania to be better so people would not really flow that, um, would, would not be that eager to move to the UK or other um, more developed European countries. So statistical evidence shows that actually European countries do use these mechanisms. Yeah, but do, do, they, do they work? I mean, let me give a, a, an answer in the alternative. Either this is a serious problem, because large numbers of people are coming for this reason, in which case Europe probably couldn't spend the kind of money that would change that, or it's not such a serious problem. So why are you spending that money with that goal? I mean, there's lots of very good reasons to spend money on development aid and, and African Marshall Plans and all the rest of it. There are lots of very good reasons for it. But the people who are using the, the, the hitching of those good things to tackling root causes, because this is going to stop lots of people coming from migration, is seriously short-sighted. Uh, and it's done by lots of people. Because they think, great, if I can hook my particular cause 
to migration, I get it. So this is great for me, this is great for development, this is great for Marshall Plans and the rest of it, but it's nuts, right? Because these things are good in their own right. Do not then go adding to people's fears that there is a migration invasion, which is not true, but is central to a populist narrative and the myth that they attend. Okay, um, this gentleman, and then Monica, and then we'll finish. All right, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm George Olagoskufis from Fletcher. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, the, the, the topic of the panel is European integration or disintegration. And we know that Europe has, has moved forward whenever there were initiatives for further integration. And it has always retreated when it got stuck in a defense type of mode like we have in the, in the last 10 years. So you know, what I would like to ask the panel is, you know, what is your single best idea for every one of you for, for you know, some positive initiative that would help European integration? Monica, you want to ask Also on European integration and moving forward, uh, I have a question to you because I don't have the answer to myself, so maybe you help me. Uh, we have a common market, we have a common currency, euro, but we don't have a common political will to regulate the common market and the common currency. We are 27 member states, <coughs> and before any European Council states, president, pre presidents and uh, <coughs> ministers, uh, the president of the uh, European Council is running from one country to the other uh, to negotiate from France to Italy, and then they change to when you, you bail out. You don't imagine that the, the committee of ministers, finance ministers, didn't meet uh, a lot of times, and the negotiators run away, uh, run from one capital to another, because they don't, can't go to the European Council and uh, tell the press we didn't reach a decision. The decision is reached before surprises could come, yes. So this is a political will. It's very dissipated, and it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to make it work. In some cases, like it's happening in bailing out Greece, but in other cases, it doesn't happen. And that's the difference by the federalization which you mentioned, uh, Vivian. Uh, you, you have here concentrated the power uh, Yes, thank you. Can we then finalize maybe last words? Yes. Uh, I'm going to try to answer the question on the single best idea. It's, uh, all of the challenges that I could speak about on Greece are actually European challenges. You said it yourself. They're just manifested in, in a certain grave way uh, in Greece. All of those challenges, the spillover effect is pan-European at least. So in a sense, the solution should be on, on that level as well. Uh, one of the topics I didn't talk about is productivity vis-a-vis -vis what we call the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution. Sigmar Gabriel spoke about this, uh, about reskilling and about how many people are losing their jobs in certain areas of Germany. Um, I feel that we, we lack the tools to answer to these types of problems. Uh, if all of these technologies materialize, we will have huge levels of unemployment within 10 to 15 years. I don't believe that the process of creative destruction will create ma as many jobs as the jobs that will be shred by the new technologies. So the answer, when we speak about the topic typically the, in such panels, the answer is reskilling. Let's develop good reskilling projects for those who are going to lose their jobs. The reality is that we don't have many good examples of reskilling uh, on, on that aspect. I haven't found many good case studies on how you could reskill populations. We typically think of teaching 50-year-old uh, people who lost their jobs programming. Okay, uh, we can do that, but it's not enough. Uh, I find it extremely marginal. So my answer would be to develop a pan-European project of reskilling uh, for the specific types of employments that will lose their jo the jobs on a pan-European level. Drivers, 4% of the European, pop of the European uh, working population are drivers. In 10 years or 15 years, they will be out of a job. And it might sound science fiction, it's here, it's the reality. So we need to develop not national solutions to this. We need the pan-European therapy. Single best idea. Um, 
I mean, I think I've already said, I think each area, each policy community, if you will, has to develop its own best idea with its own particular, with those countries that are willing to move forward with new ideas to do so. And it will be different countries in different areas. But I think one area, Eurozone, for example, God only knows what's going to happen there. I mean, I think it's, it's in a kind of limbo because Northern Europeans don't want to move forward. Uh, and Southern Europeans are really hurting because these are not the rules that are going to work for them. So there needs to be some way out of that problem. Um, and um, uh, you know, I think that's pie in the sky. Yes, there'll be a budget, but it's not going to be enough. There needs to be serious invest. If 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 you're going to say that EU member states in the euro have to stick to the rules. Um, which are still kind of austere, no, but on, on the spending issues and they really can't do much, then you have to have investment at the e European level. You need transport, you need infrastructure. Mm -hmm. These things can be done and, the, and, and people at the European level are already talking about that. Moscovici, it's generally the French. So I think as Sigmar Gabriel said, Germany needs to have new ideas here as well. Be willing to step up to the plate and recognize that they're completely interdependent. And if Germany wants to survive economically in the long term, it really needs for Southern European countries also to, to prosper. And just one thing, I think that one area that is possible and actually useful for a new narrative would be security and defense. That is not my area, but I think you can make, you know, I think, I think that's a narrative that can work, that can actually also join the migration thing, to be, look, we are defending you, don't worry, they're not barbarians <coughs> anyway, but even if they were, we have your back. And, and I think that, that could really work. But, you know, back to, to, to Monica's last question, you know, is there a common will? No. Um, and the kind of politicization I talked about at the bottom, from the, at, from the bottom up and at the top, makes it even harder, which means that we have to you know, go back to what is the EU? This is not one common project anymore. It is many projects in which everyone is involved in some way in a multiplicity of these projects, and therefore we're all together in some kind of soft core Europe, but no single hard core, or you destroy it all. Defense is the is the area in which this is not the driver really, where it is most uh, you know integrative efforts taking place. Well, with some limitations, but the cooperation fund, the defense cooperation fund, is doing some steps. This lady, sorry, she has been uh, raising the hand for quite well, a long time. Well, I just wanted to say, what about uh, restructuring the world for global warming? That would be a good project to get into, and why don't I mean it? very difficult for all countries to do it at the same time, but is this cooperation in Europe can be done. Yeah. Final word, John? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to make a repeat pitch for my, for my own idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the point... Whatever domain it is, Europe needs to find concrete, realizable policies that are consistent with the values it preaches. Macron cannot continue to make speeches like he made at the Sorbonne and then deliver nothing that right. implements them. Now, migration is both urgently necessary and doable. So focus on that one. That was a perfect final word. Thank you.